As cities and counties throughout the country set record eviction rates, police and landlords prepare to amp up the ante. All right, guys, hello, and welcome to another episode of Thinking Out Loud. This week, we're going to be discussing the ongoing eviction crisis. Now, you know, we heard a lot about the looming eviction crisis uh, in the years of 2020, 2021, at the height of the pandemic. There was a lot of discourse about, um, you know, rent control or, you know, eviction moratoriums. Uh, to stop people from being kicked out of their homes uh, during a time when a large portion of the population was unemployed due to the pandemic, due to restaurants and other businesses being shut down, right? Um, since that time, however, uh, we haven't heard as much about it. It's kind of gone into the you know backlog or the back burner uh, of the news cycle, especially as you know more pressing global events. Uh, have come down upon us, uh, you know, i.e. the war in Ukraine, uh, mounting tensions uh, with China and things like that. Uh, so I figured it was about time to come back and discuss this issue because it is absolutely um, terrifying for hundreds of thousands, millions of Americans, right? Um, and I believe it's important to have a discussion about this because, you know, the price of housing, uh, the possibility of being kicked out of our homes, is an issue that affects all of us, uh, despite whatever political leanings we may have, whatever ethnicity we're from, whatever religion we may have, right? So I'm gonna jump into this video here, guys. Um, I'll be talking later towards the end of the video about this sort of cringe uh, article that's come out of landlords taking self-defense classes to um, you know, oust tenants and things like that. Uh, but I'll be saving that more towards the end. I sort of want to grease the wheels with a wider discussion about the eviction crisis, uh, you know, provide you guys with some statistics showing just how bad it is and, you know, sort of provide some analysis on why the housing crisis is so bad, right? So we'll go ahead and jump in here, guys. Um, I'll pull up my screen mirror. First thing I have here for you is I'm going to go through a series of little snippets um, providing statistics uh from out throughout the country from the four corners of the country really of just how bad um the eviction crisis is right um this first one i have here is from 12 news it says maricopa county evictions highest since the 2008 housing crisis data shows the total amount of evictions this january january of 2023 was 13 higher than what county courts called the normal for pandemic comparisons. So 13% higher, right, already, the first month out of this year. It says Maric uh, Maricopa County, Arizona, more than 7,000 evictions were filed in Maricopa County during the first month of 2023, the largest amount of county evictions since the 2008 crisis. January's data all was also a 13% increase from what county officials have been calling, quote unquote, normal, as if any evictions are normal, right? Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, according to Maricopa County Justice Court's data, the latest numbers continue an increase in eviction for the seventh month straight. So seven months on end, we've had a increase, a large percentage increase of evictions, at least in this county. And as we'll see, uh, some of the other statistics, statistics I'm gonna show you reflect that as well. Um, so let's just double check this here quick. It says January's data was also a 13% increase from what county officials have been calling normal during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we know that um, evictions skyrocketed um, during the pandemic. They were somewhat uh, held in place or staved off to a degree as a result of eviction moratorium and stuff like that. But even, even despite that, um, we saw a lot of evictions still occurring, you know, landlords and um, uh, property management corporations are, I mean, they're real slick. They know how to do legalese. They have lawyers. They have, you know, um, assets in City Hall and things like that. So we still saw a large amount of uh, evictions despite that. Uh, but as a whole, during the pandemic, evictions went up as a, you know, result of people being employed due to the pandemic. Um, but what they're saying is as these federal evictions, as the federal evictions moratoriums have been gone for a while, now we're seeing states begin to phase out their own eviction moratoriums that provided some protections for tenants. Uh, as a result of that, 
we're seeing a 13% increase from an already massive increase due to the pandemic. All right, going on here, guys, I have some information from the Minnesota House of Representatives says evictions on the rise in Minnesota, a crisis bigger than before the pandemic committee hears. Over 22,000 evictions were filed in Minnesota last year. In other words, one in 30 renter households across the state faced an eviction. Rachel Sterling, a housing attorney at Homeline, told the House Housing Finance and Policy Committee on Tuesday that the eviction crisis didn't start when the eviction moratorium phase out expired in 2022. She said that it had been going on prior to the pandemic, but it is still here and bigger than before. Uh, so obviously we just did, you know, the Northwest was Maricopa County in Arizona. Now we're seeing it as well in Minnesota. And mind you, Minnesota is a state with um, – similar um iowa is a similar case where i'm from you know minnesota and iowa are states with a somewhat lower uh cost of living standard as compared to the rest of the country right due to it's being in the midwest you know rents are you know generally lower the price of consumer goods are generally lower here than just about anywhere else in the country i think the only states where it may be lower is like missouri and montana wyoming you know uh definitively more rural um, uh, states, right? So what we're seeing here from the Minnesota House of Representatives is, again, reiterating what was said in the article about Maricopa County, Arizona, that these eviction rates are, um, they've been going on for a while. This, this process has been going on for a while. Obviously, the homelessness crisis was going on long before uh, the pandemic, right? But what's happened is due to the pandemic, due to the you know, the, the war in Ukraine and the subsequent price gouging by corporations, um, uh, inflation and things like that, uh, it's only getting worse. And you would think that with the economy being back open as a result of the pandemic uh, ostensibly coming to an end that, you know, maybe these um, statistics would flatline a bit or perhaps go to pre-pandemic quote-unquote normals. Uh, but what we're seeing, as a matter of fact, is the opposite of that. We're seeing them compound and get even worse, right? Uh, going on with this here, guys, we have some uh, statistics, few panels of this from uh, The Hill, an article from The Hill. Uh, it says, rents and evictions are skyrocketing. We need national housing security. And you can see here in this image, it's sort of a Fox eviction notice. Uh, says, notice is hereby given that we are terminating your tenancy in Florida's pol policy-making process. Uh, so obviously a um, condemnation of government officials that are in bed with uh, real estate speculators and things like that. It says, a rent control advocate signs his name to a mock eviction notice. Uh, we'll jump into the statistics here, guys. Um, says, the Las Vegas Justice Court is on track to hear over 45,000 eviction cases in 2022. Excuse me, guys. 45,000 eviction cases in 2022 for just the Las Vegas area. That's insane, right? Um, obviously, this article is from a year prior, I believe. As compared to earlier years, when the average was closer to 30,000 cases. Uh, now, Las Vegas is a pretty big metropolitan area, but, I mean, this is just an obscene amount of people being – 45,000 people homeless. And I wonder with these statistics, does it factor in, you know, the children and things like that? Um, how many families is that kicked out on the street, right? Uh, so that's a 15,000 increase um, compared to earlier years. It says, in Dallas County, home to the city of Dallas – Landlords filed almost 60,000 evictions between January 2021 and November 2022. 60,000. So just here, these first figures, uh, that's 100,000 people filed uh, for eviction. And how many of those are joining the homeless population in the street? I imagine a large number of them, right? Um, in September of this year, 6,685 eviction cases were filed in the Phoenix metro area, Again, marking the highest number since 2008. Absolutely insane, guys. A little bit more here. It says evictions have surged in Oklahoma County, which includes Oklahoma City, and are over 40% higher 
than they were prior to the pandemic, with over 1,800 evictions filed in September alone. So we are just seeing some absolutely crazy figures here um, of eviction rates. Uh, I mean, I don't even know what would the amount be here. I mean, we just probably clocked from the beginning of this little expose, these articles I've been showing you guys, we've probably clocked, you know, 200,000 people uh, from just a couple of articles highlighting um, a few counties and cities in the country, you know, uh, and we're going to jump in here actually to the next one talking about, I think it was New York. Um, but just insane guys, I've only just listed, like, like I said, a few counties and, and, uh, and cities, and it's already up to a quarter of a million people just about kicked out onto the street. Uh, again, from the Hill here, guys says the lack of a guarantee of housing stability has significant implications for the exercise of other civil and political rights in our system. Housing insecurity impacts individuals' health and well-being, obviously, their ability to work and their ability to vote and participate in our political system. Housing insecurity poses an existential threat to the promise of economic opportunity for all, but it disproportionately impacts minority communities. And we'll get into this next article uh, here in a second. Um, so I do want to talk about this, guys, uh, before we get into some more statistics, right? Um you know, the United States prides itself as being this bastion of democracy. Now, anybody who watches this channel um, is already keenly aware of the extreme disparities in the democratic process here in the United States, uh, the way in which our democratic, quote unquote, systems and institutions uh, inherently, you know, lean, uh, lean towards or give more credence or uh, opportunity or power to giant corporations and wealthy individuals while the rest of us tend to be more disenfranchised, right? Um, and, you know, sometimes you hear the mainstream media and more liberal thinkers, you know, talk about um, expanding voting rights. I mean, that's a big thing, obviously, with Democrats right now. They can't seem to do anything for the economy or for the struggles of working class people, so they've sort of made a bit of spectacle uh, – uh, political theater out of the idea of pushing for more voting rights. And now that is an important part of the discussion because we see the ways in which gerrymandering, uh, you know, keeps black and brown people from actually, you know, putting their own communities, community members into positions of power within the legislator or whatever branch of government. That is an issue. Um, we see, we saw through the primaries of 2016, 2020, and um, also during, you know, congressional and senate elections you know uh, both parties really do do this but we saw especially the republican republican party you know shut down polling stations make it incredibly difficult to do a um, mail-in ballot all these kinds of things so these are important um, topics around the discussion of making a more salient democracy here in the united states but you'll find that in the corporate news media of course um the role of economic stability or economic rights or economic bill of rights is always left out of the discussion of making uh, a more democratic society. And I think this little segment here is a great testament to that kind of hits the, you know, the creature on the nose here. Um, says, you know, people don't have access to housing, their ability to work and their ability to vote and participate in our politi political system is damaged. Um, and this is the thing, guys. Uh, you can't have a democracy, and you cannot, as a citizen of a democracy, engage in the democracy and the systems of democracy if you are so, you know, squished by the boot of capitalist exploitation that you don't have the time to go vote. You don't have the time to make yourself politically literate. You don't have the time to study candidates. So you're more prone to be lied to or fall victim to more identitarian or uh, cultural politics. Uh, or you're more inclined if because you haven't become politically literate or, or been able to do the sort of studying that, you know, folks like you guys who are watching this channel do to understand that, you know, demeanor and personality is not a political policy that will have any implication on your life. Right. So I just want to highlight that here quick and we'll jump into some more statistics here, guys. Um, so this one here is from Truth Out um, and it's going to highlight. In particular, a case that happened a few years ago, I think it was three years, 
three years ago now uh, with Moms for Housing. It's going to kind of grease the wheels for a further discussion. It says, housing activists unite to fight mass evictions and defund the police. Calling for rent cancellation, housing activists are preparing to face off with cops evicting black and brown renters. It says here, the country is already in the beginning stages of a massive eviction crisis. Again, this article is from a few years back, now a couple years at least. As housing courts nationwide reopen, as many as 28 million renters could lose their home in the coming eviction wave, boosting the national homeless rate by as much as 40 to 45 percent by the end of the year. And now when you look at... Um, when you look at figures like this, 28 million renters, increase of a homeless population by 40 to 45 percent, it almost feels sensationalist. Um, but then when I show you the statistics that we had at the beginning of this episode, denoting 200,000 people from just a handful of um, counties and cities already, I mean, you begin to understand that 28 million people isn't that far off. And it's hard to even fathom what 28 million people homeless on the street. And again, not all of them, I assume, will be homeless. I'm sure that a good portion of them have probably found at least some modicum of housing in the interim. But still, even let's let's cut that number um, by a quarter, right? You're still looking at 5 to 10 million people, right, homeless on the street. Uh, and it's hard to even fathom, like, what that does to our civic infrastructure, what that does to the society as a whole, right? Going on with this reading here, guys, says, the wave will hit low-income black and brown people who are twice as likely to rent as white people. Um, the hardest, according to an Urban Institute survey, in which half of adult renters reported having trouble paying rent or bills from late March to mid-April. This is back in 2020 or 2021 again. Black and brown renters were most likely to report reduced spending on food, depleted savings, or increased credit card debt. According to the latest census data, 44% of black tenants reported having little or no confidence that they could make their re next rent payment. So absolutely insane, man. Um, Half of renters had trouble paying their rent during this year. And as the other articles suggested, it seems like this trend is only continuing to get worse, right? Um, going on here, guys, says, even before the pandemic, the U.S. was facing affordable housing, eviction, and homelessness crisis disproportionately impacting black and brown people. In 2019, about 5,000 or 568,000 people experienced homelessness on a single night. So, and those statistics probably fluctuate. And keep in mind with this statistic too, guys, um, this is what's, you know, logged. This is what comes up as statistics. I mean, how many people, by their very nature, homeless people are people by, who fall through the cracks in our society. I mean, that's the clearest example of how wide the gaps in the social safety net are is homelessness, right? So by their very nature, being homeless, they are people who've fallen through the gaps in our society. So it stands to reason that this number could be much higher. And I suspect it is. I, I truly, I don't have statistics offhand, but I, I suspect at the end of the day in the United States of America, you know, two to three million people are homeless, and if they are not directly homeless, um, they are affected in some way, shape, or form by how, uh, housing insecurity. Like the fact that they could go homeless at any time, or that they are staying with friends or family members, you know, sort of couch surfing uh, and things like that, right? So just absolutely insane how endemic this crisis has become. Um, going on here, guys, says... Militarized evictions in Oakland. So this is part of the discussion that we've been, been seeing recently uh, is that the increased militarization of police goes, in hand, goes hand in hand with a, a growing homelessness population, with a growing population of uh, disenfranchised workers that have less and less, even smaller and smaller uh, share of the pie, right? Uh, it says, Dominique Walker, an activist with Moms for Housing, a collective of unhoused and housing insecure mothers in Oakland, California, told Truth Out that the collective's organizing pressure has been key in city leaders' decision 
to extend Oakland's eviction moratorium to August 31st. So keep that in mind, guys. The only reason we've had, um, you know, regional eviction moratoriums uh, hold up for as long as they have is because people have fought tooth and nail for it. And this is obviously how it is with any issue here in the United, here in the United States. Uh, it says, nonetheless, several of the mothers say their housing is still in danger. They won't be able to pay their owed rent when the city's moratorium expires. Uh, going on here says, this is the police state that we live in where they will spend tens of thousands just to make you get out of a speculative owned property rather than help you get permanently housed. So this is something for you guys to consider. Um, with the whole debate with policing stuff, the amount of money that they spend doing these evictions, uh, arresting people for being homeless, cracking heads, uh, all this, all this, all this. I mean, this stuff co costs tens of thousands of dollars. Or, you know, when homeless people end up <coughs> or poverty-stricken people generally um, end up in prisons or jails, you know, that costs tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, per prisoner uh, to house them and feed them and stuff within the correctional facilities. Um, so as we see here with this little quote, it's a, just a prime example of how inefficient this system is and how it doesn't need to be this way because they probably spent, you know, forty to $60,000 kicking these moms out of this house or whatever. Uh, when they could have just paid for them to have an apartment from the city. It's absolutely insane, guys. Going on here says, when the moratorium lifts, tenants could owe $10,000 or more in back rent. Many simply won't be able to pay and could wind up on Oakland streets where they join an unhoused population that has already jumped by 47% in the past two years. Excuse me, guys. After struggling to keep her family housed while working two jobs, Walker and three other working mothers reclaimed a vacant investor-owned house on the 2900 block of Magnolia Street last November to call attention to the city's displacement machine. So they did this, uh, one, I guess to have housing, but also to make a political statement. And they definitely got what they wanted out of that, as we'll see here. Says the Alameda County Sheriff's Office evicted the moms and their children in a high-profile militarized raid in early January. Sheriff's deputies decked in riot gear and armed with AR-15s showed up with an armored tank and a specialized robot. This is how far along this uh, late-stage capitalist system we've gotten, guys. We've gotten to the point... I mean, this sounds like something out of dead space, or I don't even fucking know. But we've gotten to a point, guys where moms and children are evicted from their home that's owned by a giant speculative corporation that has does not have any tenant in the home, doesn't do anything with it except gamble with it on the uh, market exchange for housing. Uh, women and children, moms and children, are evicted from their home with nowhere else to go with machine guns and fucking police that looks like robots with all their fucking gear and armor and military great equipment and a goddamn robocop robot fucking police machine this is where we're at i mean fuck the dystopic fiction at this point am i right who needs it we're living it every single day absolutely insane going on with this here guys though it says the eviction ultimately cost the county forty thousand dollars well beyond the cost of simply housing the families a point the moms are now zeroing in on ahead of looming eviction wave. So again, instead of just housing moms and children, you're going to spend $40,000 on the raid alone. Now imagine these women did end up going to jail and stuff like that as well. So just consider by the end of this, it probably cost eighty dollars to $100,000. That could have kept all those moms and their children in housing for the full year. And the whole thing could have been avoided. But no, you have to protect the property rights of a giant corporation that speculates on the, one of the most needed commodities uh, for human life, housing. Right. Absolutely insane. You know how on the police cars it says to serve and protect? Yeah, to serve you an eviction notice and to protect the private property of some fucking real estate investment firm. That's what it's about. Going on here, guys. 
Um, there still hasn't been any explanation of why they came with that much force for mothers and babies. I mean, just think about it, guys. Insane. The January eviction was a very violent display and was meant to cause terror in folks who are standing up for their human rights, Walker says. This is the police state that we live in, and we already read this quote, uh, where they will spend tens of thousands just to make you get out of a speculatively owned property. Um, so again, guys, this is what this came down to. This is to make an example out of peasants. This is, an exa- this is to make an example of wording, working class people. Hey, don't think about squatting on our investment. I know you're homeless. I know you're hungry. Don't think about going into housing that's vacated anyways to try to give shelter to your family. And don't think about, as in past examples where we saw police show up and crack down on people um, dumpster diving for food that was thrown out due to a power outage, still fresh food. Uh, Don't think about even taking the scraps away from the people who have all the money and the power. Because if you do, we'll show up with jackboots and gun barrels. Uh, It's the same as hanging. This is the same process, really, of hanging the rabble rouser in the city square that we've seen throughout history, right? This is what this is, to make no mistake about it. Uh, Going on here, guys, I think we'll have a video coming up. Play this for you guys. Oop, hang on. Sorry about that. I don't know why the sound didn't start. Now to some breaking news in Alameda County. Oakland deputies forcibly removing the Moms for Housing group from that vacant house on Magnolia Street. Let's get right over to CBSN Bay Area's Jackie Ward at the scene. Jackie? Michelle, the eviction process is drawing quite a crowd here at 30th and Magnolia in West Oakland. Take a look at all of these people who are here. Of course, the area by the home has been blocked off by the Alameda County Sheriff's look Office. The they have armored look at the officers they here. They have a lot of people in babies. support standing here as well. Earlier this morning, the babies. sheriff's deputies they had to knock down the door and, and break this through it in job. order this to get the moms and kids out. They have arrested five people so far, including the moms and some of the protesters and supporters here. The Moms for Housing group released a statement earlier this morning. They said, quote, instead of allowing us to buy this home through the Oakland Community Land Trust for exactly what they paid for it, Wedgwood CEO Greg Geiser has chosen to enact physical violence on us and our families. We won't leave our home and our neighbors, friends and family are standing with us in solidarity. So this just happened around five this morning. Morning. That was when we first got word that the Alameda County Sheriff's Department was here. They are evicting the Moms for Housing group Mothers who lives here. They've been living here since November. The home is owned by Wedgwood Properties, who has offered to pay for their moving expenses and for shelter for two months at Catholic Charities. Those mothers have called the, that offer an insult. So this is what's happening today. We will continue to stand by and bring you the latest information on this eviction. All right, guys. So. As I said, this happened a couple of years ago. Um, But, I mean, in that video, you can just see fucking militarized police showing up to kick mothers and babies out of a vacant home, right? There's no one living there. And as it said in the video as well, the, the mothers tried to get together with the land trust in the community to buy the home for what the speculative real estate property investment firm paid for it. So this is a key uh, component of the housing crisis we're facing right now is housing has ceased to be about housing, human beings, you know, it's in the name housing. It's become another speculative commodity, just as disgusting and asinine and completely irrational as NFTs, right? Uh, and we saw this as well with the housing crisis in 2008, where they completely tanked the economy by speculating on subprime mortgages, right? Uh, housing has become an asset, a, a figure on a screen to be bought, sold, and traded, right? And human beings that are in need of housing are at the bottom of the list of those who get considered. It's whoever has cash in hand. It doesn't matter if you sit it. And this is why a lot of these places end up being vacant for so many years, um, is because they're waiting for a fluctuation in the market, just like you would with a stock or a bond. You're waiting for it to go up or down to sell it or to buy more. 
So these houses or these uh, commercial buildings, i.e. malls or office buildings, will sit completely vacated for years and years and years, sometimes a decade or more, while there's millions of human beings homeless on the street just because they're waiting for the profit margin to be you know, large enough or wide enough for them to sell it and make a profit. And you have to consider this in a zoomed out existential way. How sick and perverse and how mixed up our priorities are as a society that the profit margin of a real estate investment company takes precedent over human beings in need of a home. The homes are out there. The spaces are out there for people to not be in the cold or the heat or the desolate environment sleeping on the concrete. But instead of just moving them in there, there really shouldn't even be a discussion. Just let's get them in there. Let's you know get the government agencies like, hey, you need housing? Here's a house. Here's an apartment. Oh, if the community doesn't have enough, here's a fucking vacated mall that we're going to, or an office building. We're going to take the offices. We're going to take the storefronts. We're going to turn them into housing where there's beds and homes and shit. I mean, there is no excuse for this other than the lack of political will, a, a lack of political will that exists because these real estate firms uh, buy and sell politicians the same way that they buy and sell homes, right? Right. Um, just disturbing stuff, guys. And this is a trend that we're only going to see uh, continue to be exacerbated as capital continues uh, to be conglomerated, compounded into some of these larger firms like Vanguard or BlackRock, right? The, far, the, the more capital crystallizes, the more capital conglomerates and monopolizes in on itself, compounding more and more and more, the more far removed the capitalist comes. Uh, becomes from the society as a whole, right? They become uh, wrapped, wrapped in a, a cocoon of, of capital, and you know, one could even, you know, picture that what comes out of this cocoon is this, is the butterfly, the moth of fucking fascism, as it as the contradictions of this wealth, uh, you know, compounding becomes so large with so many people on the outside of this cocoon becoming disenfranchised that the the capitalist in control of the state turns to fascist uh, means uh, to continue to control its control over wealth, right? Um, let's see here, guys. I have a couple more videos from this story I want to share with you guys because it's just so indicative of how severe this contradiction has come between the haves and the have-nots. So we'll go on here with this next one, right? A live look now from Chopper 5 over... Okay, so this next one is a few days after the initial eviction, right? And you can see uh from the housing here they they've set up barricades i mean just insane there's nobody living here uh, my understanding is there's no one going to be living here there's no one buying the home it's just sitting here waiting for the price to go up uh, or to be resold at a profit and you know you've probably got a homeless family on the corner nearby here right out of shot um and instead of just putting them in there You've got a fucking fence around it. Absolutely insane. So we'll roll this for you guys. That house in West Oakland, you can see a fence now around the property. And a live look now at Santa Rita Jail in Dublin, where the people arrested during that eviction process were taken. Let's get right over to our Jackie Ward live in Oakland, where members of the group Moms for Housing were trying to prevent deputies from getting into the home. Jackie? Anna Michelle, just minutes ago, this fencing was put up. The windows and doors are boarded up. The eviction notice is on the door, and now some of the moms are in jail. This house was a statement. It was a symbol of what needs to happen in Oakland. This was an absolute victory. We're still victorious, and we're going to keep it moving. At 5.15 this morning, the Alameda County Sheriff's Office carried out an eviction order for the people living at 2928 Magnolia Street, dressed in full riot gear with automatic weapons. They arrested two of the moms and two of their supporters. We're here, moms. Within 15 minutes, more than 300 Moms for Housing supporters were out on the street. Who's out? Moms out! Who's out? Moms out! We have to keep fighting because we see what we're up against and they're, they're scared of us. They're scared of people power and we got to show them. We have to mobilize and we have to show them that we're here and we're not going anywhere. Sergeant Ray Kelly with the Sheriff's Office said this was not your typical eviction given the amount of attention it's gotten. The sheriff said the moms made it nearly impossible to open the doors. We could not enter the home traditionally uh, with a key or, or using a locksmith. Um, they were 
fortified in such a way that we had to use uh, a ram and a tremendous amount of force. What is this police force? What is this military force for? Because we had hundreds of people? Hundreds of people weren't out here with AR-15s to combat the sheriffs? The owner of the home, real estate development company Wedgwood Properties, released a statement following the eviction saying, quote, Wedgwood is pleased this illegal occupation of its Oakland home has ended peacefully. That is what we have sought since the start. We will now work with a nonprofit to renovate the home, giving opportunities to at-risk Oakland youths and splitting the profits with the nonprofit so that others may benefit. As this movement continues to grow, some Oakland residents are scared that homeless moms may move into their property. We are not trying to take the individual properties of in moms and pops. Don't let Sam Singer tell you that. Like, what if they decide to take my car? What if they decide to take my house? We're not talking about that. We're talking about the greed of wealthy corporations that are robbing all of us. We asked Dominique where she would live now that she can't live here on Magnolia Street. She said her community had her back and all the children are safe. The children were fortunately not home when the eviction was served. This is a live look from Chopper 5 of the Santa Rita Jail in Dublin, where the four people who were arrested are expected to be released any moment now. Four people, that includes two of the moms who lived at this home and two of their supporters. Live from West Oakland, Jackie Ward, KPIX 5. All right, so... You get the idea here, guys. Um, so obviously you saw the sheriff's deputy or, or whatever, the commissioner or whoever he was, uh, make it out like they showed up in force like this because a bunch of moms and babies were fortified in the home. And also that they showed up with such a large militarized force because there was people gathering to show their support. They showed up with guns. They showed up with an armored vehicle, battering rams. Absolutely insane. And I want to drive home to you guys that however you feel about police, I know there's some people that probably watch the show that are still on the fence about police. You know, the discussion around defunding the police, moving away from our current policing systems. They say, oh, well, we need police to stop crimes and, you know, public safety and stuff like that. Okay, okay, okay. We're not going to have a discussion about that today. But I want to drive this home that if the economy tanks, and you lose your job, and you can't pay your bills, and you own a home or you rent a home, it is the police, it is the sheriff's department that will be kicking in your door with a fucking machine gun or a shotgun to get you out of that house so that that property can go back to the bank or to the landlord, okay? Whatever you think. Maybe you think that they keep you safe or stop you from getting raped or do all this or that, which statistics show is not fucking true, but let's just say it is true. Okay, this militarized police force, as this woman put it from Moms with Housing, is explicitly designed to protect private property. And guess what? If you're not able to pay the rent or the mortgage on that private property, it doesn't matter that it's been that you've been paying rent for decades, been paying your mortgage and have it almost paid off, they will kick you out at gunpoint. And if you try to resist, they'll arrest you, throw you in a cell, or worse, Beat your fucking brains in or put a bullet in the back of your head. Okay? They are the agents of capital. That's what police do. That is their primary purpose is to defend private property. And you are on the opposite side of that class war. That needs to be clarified. Um, but, yeah, just insane, guys. Just insane. It needs to be a testament. Uh, you know, they make it pretty clear, like, this is an issue that affects all of us. And, again, you know, this she talks about. You know, some residents are worried that, oh, well, what's going to stop them from doing this to my house? Uh, and this kind of brings up a discussion about, like, a small landlord, like, say, an elderly couple that is the case with my rental property that I live in. You know, it's like a 70-year-old couple that this is like their retirement income, right? Um, and you know, we'll see some discourse on the left about, you know, it doesn't matter. They're still landlords or on the opposite class of, uh, as us. Um, and that is, that is very true. Like at the end of the day, like I've had this discussion with my daughter, you know, even I try to keep her politically literate even at a young age. Um, that is true. You know, at the end of the day, their income, their class privilege as landlords or sometimes petty capitalists 
will come over your human right to housing. Um, despite the fact that they may be decent, God-fearing people uh, outside of that, right? That is very true, but I think it's important as we're trying to build mass movements to differentiate between the petty landlord that owns a rental house that a lot of times, like in the case of my landlord, they lived here their whole lives until they built their own house and whatever, you know. Uh, but we we should have some demarcation between landlords like that that were members of the working class themselves, and this was all their life savings put into this rental property as their means of retirement. You know, we should have some sympathy or understanding between that and a giant, oftentimes multinational real estate conglomerate that is like a giant monster fucking octopus looming, looming over our human right to housing, right? There needs to be a differentiation between that while also having an understanding that, you know, the the landlord, however small, however cute little couple they may be, does have a different class interest than you. Um, but also we need to recognize that, you know, for these people, these petty landlords, the little landlords that invest in these sort of things and rental income as their means of retirement, it's be, they've, a lot of them have done this because they've been pushed into that due to the system that we live in, uh, right? We live in a system where Social Security or pensions aren't going to provide you with a decent retirement anymore. Most people don't even have a pension. If they're lucky, they have a 401k, which is completely uh, – you know, dictated by the whims of the market, the ups and downs of the market. Um, so we do need to recognize that while there is a class difference between those petty landlords and, and ourselves as tenants and the lowest rung of working class people, um, we need to realize that many of them also were from the working class and that they kind of fell into this landlordship process because there was little to no other alternative. Um, and it, that needs to be – what I'm trying to say is that needs to be part of the larger discussion. And as we you know, continue to mobilize working class people against the commodification of housing, that needs to be an implicit part of the discussion. And, I mean, I don't know how – what form this takes, but we need to have a discussion of, like, do we villainize the mom-and-pop landlord – that has this one or two rental properties that they may have lived lived in. I mean, is that um, valuable to building a larger mass movement? And this discussion also goes towards like, you know, the small business owner, uh, where it's maybe a mom, a pop, and the kids, or a mom, a pop, and the kids, and one or two employees. You know, I hear a lot of discussion around that of like, oh, they're just as bad, sometimes worse than large capitalists. Um, yes, there are sometimes more abuses that happen within these small businesses because they're in such a competitive space being a small business. They don't have, you know, the clout or the or the financial autonomy or diversification. So they will sometimes exploit workers even worse. But there is the flip side of that coin where that's sometimes the complete opposite. Um, and what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say is like, you know, these are nuanced discussions. I mean, even if you go and look at uh, the deep, you know, our revolutionary ancestors like Lenin or Mao, you know, they talk about in the process of building mass revolutionary movements, you know, the petty landlord that owns very little or the petty capitalist or mercantilist or trader that owns very little, uh, they're – is a line whereupon they could be induced to join the revolutionary movement, at least uh, more of a bourgeois revolutionary movement. So I don't know. Again, I'm not some you know leftist theorist analyst. I'm very limited in my uh, you know study. I do what I can, but I mean these are bigger discussions of like how how valuable or how positive of an impact does it make on our movement to you know villainize small 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 business owners and petty landlords, right? I, I just I wonder how productive that is for a larger movement uh but enough of me rambling here guys let's go on with this discussion a little bit more i have one more little clip this one's from democracy at work from the uh moms for housing activists um i wanted to roll this one for you guys and we'll get into some more of these articles uh, because they do a great job sort of laying out the foundations of what causes housing crisis uh again here so i'll jump into this for you carol in mother jones magazine 
They write in Oakland, where buyers routinely offer hundreds of thousands of dollars over asking prices, there are nearly four vacant properties for every homeless person. It's not so right. much an issue of scarcity, but of distribution. Um, explain that further. That's what's criminal about uh, this housing crisis. There are actually places where people can live, but because it, they are private, they're privately owned, it makes it difficult to even crack into what a solution could be because the private industry doesn't have to be held accountable. And that is what we're saying is criminal. It should not be legal for anyone that owns property, particularly corporations. And we want to make a distinction because that's what's being thrown around a lot, too, is that if an individual mom and pop owner of a property um, left it empty because they're on vacation, then somehow Moms for Housing is advocating taking people's personal property. That is completely and patently false. What we're saying is corporations should not be able to hold vacant properties when there is a housing crisis. There should not be people living on the streets when there are, peop when there are places where they can live. This is, um, it, it, Oakland looks like uh, an entirely different city than it did years ago. And it's strictly due to corporations that are able to rent gouge when they have homes for rent and charge way over market for homes that are not worth what they're actually selling them for. And so this is starting a movement where people who are also experiencing housing insecurity, which means they pay, pay more than 30% of their income in rent, are waking up because they've seen this example of Moms for Housing defying what the market trends are and saying we deserve housing for all, not just for those who can pay the high, high price tax. I hate to give credence and, and time to such awful individuals and such um, evil organizations. Wedgwood Properties um, has approximately 96 subsidiary, subsidiaries and they are the real estate speculator that is um, holding the deed for mom's house. They are in the business of buying homes at rock bottom prices and flipping them. And that is part of the problem why housing is so unaffordable in cities like Oakland. They buy houses by, by, the, by bulk. So 100 to 200 properties per month, if not more. And distressed neighborhoods, uh, their words. And then they flip them and sell them to the highest bidder. So it puts home prices out of reach for many um, working class people. So they drive up the cost of rents and the cost of actually purchasing a home, which is why home ownership levels are so low. Yeah, guys. So just a, a little bit. She provides a little bit more perspective or analysis on the cause of the problem and kind of dispels. Um, some of the misnomers around these, you know, squatting movements, these occupying movements, right? Um, but again, it brings up a wider discussion, like we sort of touched on before this. Um, you know, the question is, how do we tackle this issue in a way that's going to, you know, have a lasting impact for working class people? How does it bring them over to the side of the disenfranchised? Uh, what do we do? What does a new housing system look like? Um, and you know, where does the petty landlord and stuff like that fit into this? You know, I think my personal opinion is on the discussion of landlordism, it would serve us better to focus on these large multinational corporations, right? Because at the end of the day, the petty landlord is negligible in making war upon when we should be focusing our efforts on these large multinational corporations where we can do the most damage, right? And, and hopefully deflect the ire of the smaller landlords or, or property owners, right? Um, and, and how do we do this? How do we make war on this, you know, landed gentry class is really what they've become, right? Um, and one of the first steps, obviously, would be to do a tenants union in your apartment or in your community where renters get together and organize into a union that is capable of direct action like um, – picketing, obviously, uh, refusing to pay rent, or even refusing to pay a portion of rent, and then showing up to defend one another and provide temporary housing for each other if housing or eviction is weaponized against you. Um, but, you know, that only gets us so far. That only is how we build the building blocks of power. After that, you know, what is our strategy? And this is why I say it's more important to focus on the 
large conglomerates, right? Um, we saw in Germany, or yeah, I believe it was a, a couple of towns in Germany where these tenants unions that had developed in such a way where they were able to create a more national or citywide tenants union, um, they were able to make it so that a lot of these speculative developments like she talks about were bought up by the city and managed publicly by the city, right? Um, or even you could have it done in such a way where it's neighborhood cooperatives, neighborhood tenants cooperatives, where the neighborhood, all the people in the community own the housing and democratically decide how the housing is developed or renovated or rented out, right? Um, and I say all this to make it clear that there are other options in the current system of housing that we have where it's, you know, all about market-based housing and we've seen giant corporations you know weaponize this and, and own a monopoly over it. it does not need to be this way right and but the discussion simultaneously needs to not just be about rent control and, and you know lobbying against exorbitant rent gouging it needs to be about working class people about tenants owning or at the bare minimal having democratic say over the housing system and that could take a lot of different ways and i named a few of them uh you know tenants unions um housing cooperatives and in individual neighborhoods or apartment buildings uh, or the city owning them with direct oversight from publicly elected officials right things like this um, and this is what we need to be having our discussion about as we try to mobilize more people to this discussion, right? Is that, you know, giant corporations own your city. They own your neighborhood. And it shouldn't be that way. It's you and your neighbors that should own the housing and decide what's done with it, right? Uh, going on here, guys, we have some more reading we can do. Um, so, with this discussion with moms from housing, obviously we saw the highly militarized police showing up with armored vehicles and machine guns to kick out mothers and babies. Um, going alongside this is the rise of militarized policing, the rise of the surveillance state, the rise of the police state. Um, and obviously policing, defund the police, police reform has come into a more mainstream narrative as of the result of you know BLM summer in 2020 with the death of George Floyd. It's becoming a ongoing national mainstream part of the discussion. Uh, but these two issues, as we've already stated, are interwoven with one another. Uh, they go hand in hand with each other. Uh, as housing and other commodities become uh, more and more bought up by giant corporations, police become more and more militarized to defend that property from the disenfranchised people who have nothing, right? Um, so we're going to read a little bit from these articles here. It says, a majority of police agencies across the U.S. increased budgets despite the defund movement. So in the wake of BLM summer and, and the riots and protests that happened with that and the death of George Floyd, we saw a national discussion about defunding the police or reforming the police. We've seen uh, politicians like Nancy Pelosi, uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, and Biden, you know, kind of spearhead a bit of political theater around this topic and make promises of defunding and reforming the police. It's been several years since, you know, the height of, of that movement. And we have seen, as it says here, the complete opposite. We are not seeing police defunded. We are not seeing police reformed. As a matter of fact, we're seeing budgets increase and we're seeing the creation of more task forces, task forces that are more militant and aggressive than regular police, right? Um, going on here with this guy says, however, a national investigation by the ABC owned television stations found those calls have not transformed into action. An analysis of budgets for more than 100 law enforcement agencies across the country uncovered the opposite. 90% of cities and counties increased spending for police between the fiscal years 2018, 2019, in 2021 to 2022. None of the North Carolina cities the team analyzed reported an increase in law enforcement budgets. Um, that's where the 11 ABC News is from. Of the 10% of agencies who did decrease funding, the cuts were small with only eight agencies slashing the budget by more than 2%, a percentage many local government budget experts deem irrelevant. So absolutely, um, 
egregious. After all this protesting, after all this fighting, what have we seen? We have seen an increase in budgets. And this is on purpose. Despite all the fanfare and political theater, they are raising the budgets of police, continuing to militarize them. As we've seen with the development of Cop City in Georgia, where they're building a literal military police training facility uh, that turns, uh, you know, beat police into an occupying force meant to protect private property and crack the heads of anyone who uh, expresses dissidence against a capitalist system that has gone so far out of control. Um, these things go hand in hand. Uh, as the rest of us continue to be squeezed uh, by the political class and the capitalist class, uh, police are given larger budgets, more training, and more officers. Uh, I believe Biden's Make America Safer Act uh, provided federal funding, just federal funding. This does not incorporate state or local funding for a, the hiring of another 100,000 police throughout the rest of the city. That is a small army, 100,000 police. Uh, and we saw also with that, with his bill, um, with his um, mandate that was turned into a bill that was passed through Congress, um, special funds allocated not just to hiring more local police, hiring 100,000 more local police, uh, the hiring of more federal officials like with the DA, DEA, the ATF, things like that, some of the most militant wings of the federal police force, right? So make no mistake, these two issues are, go hand in hand. And these new police, these uh, more militarized police with armored vehicles, uh, machine guns, weapons of war are especially there to put down um, any discontent you may have. If we finally reach a point where the mass of working people are finally willing to rise up against the yoke of capitalism and oppression, these police will be there to put you back in your spot, right? So moving on from this discussion, guys, I want to have um, – a bit of analysis from this USA Today article that's been making a circulation on the internet of uh, landlords taking self-defense courses as more of these eviction uh, moratoriums are peeled back, uh, preparing to take back their property uh, by force. Now, prepare for a bit of cringe, but also a bit of you know decent analysis with this. But it's just you know one laughable and a little bit hilarious but also deeply disturbing as well. So we'll jump into this here, guys. It says, eviction protection's gone. Landlords are learning to fight, period, literally. After suing to end eviction protections, a Los Angeles Property Owners Association offers landlords self-defense classes for when tenants attack. Crazy, crazy. Um, if you Google tenant landlord murder, you'll see, Carrie Rio says. The former traffic cop pushes her tortoiseshell glasses up her nose and surveys her class of property managers and landlords who have so far failed to match her pep at 9 in the morning. The poster behind her commemorates a 1948 campaign against rent control. Freedom is everybody's business, it reads. The freedom to oppress those who are less worthy than you because they don't have wealth, right? Crazy, crazy stuff. It's just... Um, Laughable. I mean, you know, they quote here, um, tenant landlord murder as if kicking people out on the street because they don't have the financial means to pay rent doesn't amount to social murder, right? Um, going on here, guys. So many cases, exclamation point, she said, grinning and shaking her head. That's why this class is so important. Um, says 11 landlords and property managers have enrolled in the two and a half hour defense class to protect themselves from quote unquote, I rate tenants, transients and other hazards of life in the private housing business. The course teaches them how to stop life threatening bleeding, maintain 360 degrees of awareness, take cover from bullets and disarm shooters. <laughs> Uh, some information on the group that's doing this uh, founded in 1917 AAGLA is the premier association representing landlords and property managers in Los Angeles. Last year, it hired the Health and Safety Institute to teach its AVERT, Active Violence Emergency Response Training Self-Defense course, because as landlords and property managers, we can be subject to verbal and or physical attacks by renters or tenant groups. The event description explains, unfortunately, the media portrays us as evil. It also cites a rising violent crime rate. 
Um, that's because you are evil. That's because you've put your standard of living and your way of life on top of uh, exploiting working class people. Because rent, at the end of the day, is theft. What is rent? It is the work that working class people do paid to the people that own the housing for no other reason than they had the money to own it in the first place. Okay, You're stealing the surplus labor value of the working class and then living a removed lifestyle from that. That's what that is, right? Crazy. The disconnect with these people is just crazy. Um, and they talk about violence against them and things like that. It's just laughable. It's just laughable. As if homelessness isn't a form of fucking violence that you guys perpetuate. As if you're not taking a self-defense course meant to drag people out of their homes where they live so that you can continue to make money off of it. Completely insane. Um, going on here, guys. Says Rios... <clears throat> excuse me. Says Rios teaches the course with Hans Sever, a six foot five inch lieutenant paramedic who said he is passionate about bleeding control. They believe landlords in particular need the training. In COVID, a lot of people lost their jobs, they lost their family, and the last thing they have is their house, Rios tells the group. You're taking the last thing they have. This is their worst day. I'm not trying to scare you but you need to be prepared for that. You're taking the last thing they have. I mean, they're conscious of this reality. That they're taking the last little bit of fucking dignity or property or way of life that these people have. Right. And rather than having an empathetic discussion or having understanding of like, well, hey, maybe I shouldn't make my money off the rent of other people, the labor of other people. No, it's about, despite this fact, it's going to make people desperate and you need to be able to defend yourself from it. I don't know how to give word to how fucking sick that is, right? Going on here, guys, says, when you go to evict, they're ready for you, she adds. We're afraid, agrees a mom and pop landlord who declined to give her name because she was worried about anti-landlord bias. She and her husband tell the group they came to learn how to deal with homeless people and tenants who get a little crazed and tenants who come after you with a video camera. <laughs> and again, I know I seem to be a little bit softer on, you know, mom and pop landlords. And I, I want to be clear that, again, their class interest is different than ours. And if you have to defend yourself against a mom and pop landlord or are going to squat on a land uh, mom and pop landlord, I'm not condemning that at all. I'm on your side first and foremost. My only question was about the wider discussion of how do we, you know, mobilize the most people and how do we direct that mobilization effort t towards like which direction? Do we focus on condemning them or do we focus on, you know, taking action against the larger uh, corporate vested interests, right? Um Anything with Lord is bad. Landlord, drug lord. The session, yes, I agree. The sessions were an immediate hit when they launched last year, successfully competing for space in a packed AAGLA calendar that also offers estate planning, Q&As with local politicians, and lectures on COVID-19 eviction protections with Dennis Black, a Los Angeles super lawyer once called the Henry Ford of evictions for his breathtaking efficiency processing cases. Today's turnout is a paltry compared to blah, blah, blah. So just crazy. I mean, this kind of gives you a window into the lives of these people and just shows you how far removed their way of life and perspective on the world is from working class people. Um, until February 1st, landlords could not evict tenants in the city of Los Angeles who cite COVID-19 as the reason they could not pay rent. The resulting conflicts between tenants and landlords in part inspired AAGLA to host the classes, said Executive De Director Dan Euclidson, who also completed the training LA County protections expire March 31st. AAGLA sued both the city and the county over their eviction protections and regularly lobbied to end the so-called moratorium. So just crazy. I mean, groups like these, the same group that's providing the self-defense, if you want to call it self-defense course, it's more like, I don't even know what you call it. It's, it's, a, it's a course training you how to be violent against working class people to drag them out of their homes. Right. Um, so the same group that's doing this quote unquote self-defense uh, organization, self-defense class is responsible for pushing nonstop 
uh, presumably since the beginning of the pan- pandemic from removing this eviction moratorium to get people out of the housing during a fucking health crisis. Crazy, crazy stuff, guys. Um, Yukelson agrees that rising rents have raised tensions too. In Los Angeles County, nearly half of tenants reported that they were unable to pay all their rent during the pandemic, according to 2021 UCLA USC study. The median amount owed was 2800 USC researchers found an estimated 73% of renters in the city of Los Angeles were rent burdened in 2019, paying more than a third of their income to their landlords, and 48% of renters were severely rent burdened, paying more than half their incomes to landlords. So again, just another window into how bad, how systemic, how far along this housing crisis has become. I mean, we've seen, we saw other similar statistics just like this for how many other counties and cities throughout the country, literally in the four corners of the country, north, southwest, west, east, New York, crazy stuff, guys. Um, it's just getting so bad, and I don't know what the breaking point will be for people, but I have the sense that it's coming soon, right? Um, going on here. Says the only thing that hasn't been done to us is painting us with horns and a tail, Euclidson said. We don't even say landlord anymore because anything with lord is bad, landlord, drug lord. That's why they call themselves property managers. That's a lot nicer, isn't it? They're fucking landlords. And you're painted like devils for a fucking reason. I mean, I don't understand how these people don't recognize the role they play in producing poverty and traumatizing working people. Crazy stuff. I just don't understand. Yukelson said he has no research demonstrating increased violence against landlords. But tenant advocates say that the pandemic heightened conflict too. LA's Eviction Defense Network said that in 2020... Complaints from tenants that their landlords were harassing them increased by 352% over 2019. Executive Director Elena Pop said that landlords barred from eviction court resorted to illegal tenant harassment to remove renters. During the pandemic, 911 calls from tenants reporting their landlords had illegally locked them out of their units also spiked, and the calls were concentrated in black and Latino neighbors neighborhoods. By the end of 2022, L.A. County landlords were again filing evictions at pre-pandemic rates. So, you know, these landlords are producing or or hosting this landlord defense course uh, saying that they're afraid for their safety. They're not afraid of their fucking safety. They're afraid of not being able to capitalize on their property. Uh, Because we saw tenant abuse, harassment skyrocket clear through these statistics posted here through USA Today. But all of us have heard anecdotal evidence, not just from news media or from people on our social media accounts, but in our own personal lives, too. And this just, again, draws to the discussion of, like, this social relation needs to be done away with in some way, shape, or form. It is inherently abusive. It is inherently exploitative. And it doesn't need to be this way, as we had a discussion earlier. There are other ways to manage housing for the public. And we need to do away with this, you know, no human being, no entity, no corporation should have that amount of power of whether or not you get to live in a fucking house or not. Plain and simple. Um, Violence, part of property management. After the morning session concluded, property managers Nadra Bloodsaw and Lupe Leon reflected on life, quote unquote, on the front lines as they fiddled with a pair of Generation 7 combat application tourniquets. Bloodsaw said a tenant called her everything but a child of God when she tried to throw out the woman's boyfriend, who was not on her lease. She cut my tires, Bloodsaw said. So this is their idea of violence. Having their tires cut or being called a bunch of names. Nowhere in their mind comes the idea that being forced to live on the fucking street on concrete with no way to get work because you don't have a a place of residence, nowhere to shelter yourself from the environment, that doesn't register that they are doing violence on the tenants. By kicking them out, they are doing violence. doesn't even come into their mind. My tires got slashed. They called me names. That's violence. Crazy. Um, Going on here says, when we serve a notice, they start screaming. Lupe said, they're yelling, why are you evicting me? Again, that's violence, guys. 
The company is safe. They're far away, Bloodsaw said. We have to deliver the hate mail. Uh, Julian Julian Suaves, an on-site manager with Roxbury Property, said violence is part of the profession more so now than ever. Uh, when members of the county's 70,000 strong homeless population break into the building, he manages looking for shelter and vacant units. Suavis and his wife are sent to remove them. Everyone knows who we are, he said. Tenants, they're more bark than bite, but they know where you live, so there's just no hiding. Yeah, brother, you should be scared because the people that you're hoarding fucking housing over, if they get the idea that if they get rid of you, there's nothing fucking stopping them from living rent-free. You know, man, I'm just going to say go ahead and maybe think about finding a different line of work that doesn't involve kicking people out of the fucking place that they live. You know, I'm sure you can if, – if you want to do security, man, go be a security guard at a mall or a hospital or something. Um, but, you know, uh, I'm going to go on, skip a bit of this um, because we're already going so long here, guys. You can find the article with a simple Google search. Uh, but I want to touch on this last part. Uh, then Sievert burst in, blah, blah, blah. People want to be Robin Hoods, Eucleson said. They want to transfer wealth from a property to someone else. They want free rent. Now they say housing is a human right. I mean, it's crazy. So imagine living in such a disconnected world where you think the idea of housing is a human right is crazy, even though it's outlined in the UN Charter that housing is a human right. But you think that Hoarding housing and building your entire life and your um, income off of other people's uh, access to housing is completely normal. Imagine having that level of disconnect. Imagine having that level of uh, moral, you know, androgynous look on life. It's crazy. Um, and it just, again, I want to say, drives home the, the disconnect, the complete you know, difference between the class that they live in and the class that we live in, how their class interests are, as a matter of fact, antithetical to our own, right? Um, but that's really all I have for you as far as source material, guys. Um, I hope I've, you know, given you quite a spectrum to show you how bad this eviction crisis has become, uh, where it's heading with these more militarized police, and, uh, you know, maybe fostered a discussion as to how this this way of managing our housing crisis could be different. I mean, there's common sense solutions to this sort of thing, uh, but the political will in the ruling class seems to, you know, be completely non-existent. Um, but with that being said, guys, you know, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, um, comment with any more source material you have uh, regarding this. Give me any more insight that you may have that I maybe didn't pass on. Um, let me know what you think about all of this, guys. It's absolutely cringe with this landlord self-defense course. I mean. <laughs> It's like something out of SNL, SNL skit, right? Um, but with that being said, guys, uh, don't forget you can support my independent media work on Patreon at patreon.com slash entitled millennials. Um, you can support me there for $1 a month. That's it if you want. Um, you get early access to all episodes. You get behind-the-scenes content, exclusive posts, a thank you at every single episode that we do, and you get to have a more direct input on the sort of content that this channel produces. So if you want to support my independent media work, join the community there. That's patreon.com slash entitled millennials. Uh, but as always, guys, I love you very much. It's been great hanging out with you, and I'll speak with you again soon. Bye. Don't feel anything